There's a real tear. Rhonda, together, we'll rally through this one. Oh, God, dude. Hey, what's going on, everybody? For First We Feast, I'm Sean Evans, and you're watching Hot Ones. It's the show with hot questions and even hotter wings. And today we're joined by Ronda Rousey. She's a former bantamweight champion and the first ever woman to be inducted in the UFC Hall of Fame. She's an actress, author, Olympian, WWE Raw Women's Champion, and not to be outdone, she also has a pretty poppin' YouTube channel as well. Check it out, subscribe, but first things first, the wings of death. Ronda Rousey, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. This has been a long time coming too long. And you know, I know that wings have always been a part of your post-fight celebratory feast. I'm curious, how spicy do you like them, though? You know what? I like them spicy enough where I can actually still taste everything else. So I'd say there's got to be like a balance to it. And uh, I guess we're going way to the far side of that balance. So um, I'll tell you where the sweet spot's, where the sweet spot's at and when we have passed the threshold. I just rip into it right away? Just rip into it, yep. I don't know if you've seen this technique before of hot wing eating. Is that a thing for you? Not the, not the first bones you've split, I don't think. Ha 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 ha, good one. <laughs> All right, so I think this is the ranch. It's pretty good on ranch. I mean, uh, yeah, I like on ranch. This is the blue cheese. Wow. I got to put my hair back before I get too saucy. So first, my compliments to your team because you've recreated the Hot One set to the point that when I walked into the studio and saw the monitor, I thought I was a ghost because I was looking <laughs> at the set, but I couldn't see myself. So I want to say that first. And my guess is that you're probably shooting from Browsy Acres, your sustainable ranch in Southern California, where you live off the land and take care of some 30 plus farm animals. How much of this lifestyle is motivated by just being practical and being responsible and how much of it is just pure doomsday prepper impulse? Um, it started as doomsday prepper, but it's like morphed into just kind of like our contribution to society is to try and like be as self-sustaining and less taxing from everybody else as possible. At first it was like reoccurring zombie dreams. I'm like, what am I gonna do? Like my mom called me the other day and she's like, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this election. I might move out of the country. I don't know what's going on. I'm so stressed out. And I'm like, mom, like I'm prepared for zombies. Okay, that's like a 10, all right? Life is great is like one. President you, you don't like is like a two or a three. Like I'm definitely prepared for two or a three. So it kind of like, if you're prepared for zombies, you just kind of feel like everything else is like, eh, you know, I could deal with it. Mmm, it's unique. Your intimate understanding of human anatomy in terms of which bones and which joints break the easiest is both <laughs> fascinating and terrifying. <laughs> in your experience, what are in fact the most vulnerable pain points for a fighter? Like the elbow only goes a certain way, the knee only goes a certain way, and the ankle only goes a certain way. They're not like a very durable joint. So it only takes like a few pounds of pressure to dislocate somebody's elbow. It actually started back in my judo days. My mom, her philosophy was, if you throw somebody, they can just not count it. If you get somebody in a pin, they could just tell you to get up. If you get somebody in a choke, they could tell you to get up and the person takes a deep breath and they're fine. But if you get somebody in an arm bar and you break their arm and they don't count it, the other person only has one arm. And if you lose to that person, then you deserve to lose. So <laughs> you should just get really good at arm bars. On that note, how would you break down the components of a perfect arm bar? Mm. Like a lot of people would teach, oh, you're supposed to turn your toes in and squeeze with your knees. Or I always cross my ankles when I bring my heels into my butt and open my knees. I remember like watching the commentary, one of my fights and one of the commentaries were like, she just needs to squeeze her knees a little bit. And I'm like, shut the fuck up. You don't even know what you're talking about, okay? My armbar's perfect, fuck you. Mmm. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
So most people got to know you as the face of UFC, but when you were 16 years old, you were actually the number one ranked judoka in the world and had competed in two Olympics by your 21st birthday. Literally translated from Japanese as the gentle way, judo is steeped in philosophical principles about using body and mind efficiently. Can you enlighten me on judo's core interplay between the violent and the gentle? Mm, it basically comes from people fighting each other in like samurai armor. So that's why there's no striking in judo because why would you punch or kick somebody that's covered in armor? That's why like the pins and throws count as a win because if you could like get somebody to the ground and pin them, you can pull out a knife or whatever and stab them or something like that. The gentle way means nobody dies. Like you're supposed to be fine. Like at the end, you know, you, you can, like in a judo tournament, you can have like five, seven matches in a day and you're not supposed to really get injured even though, you know, shit happens. But like it's gentle way as in it's like not part of warfare, warfare anymore, it's a sport. Angry goat, I like that name. I got six goats. <laughs> the sweetness was like in the middle. At first I would taste like barbecue, like hints of barbecue. Then it was sweet. And then now it's like the spice is coming in. Yeah. There it is. It's got layers, man. So you have a really strong understanding of the economics of fighting, and you can even in a more broadly way really explain the business of sports in layman's terms. Between the UFC, WWE, and Hollywood, which industry is the most unpleasant to negotiate a contract in? Oh my gosh. With the UFC, I mean, I always like, am very much about betting on myself. I would You want, like the like, back end. You like the back yeah, end. Yeah, I, I care about the back end. Like, pay me whatever you think is fair. All I really care about is, you know, um, having some stake in how well this does, and I'll make sure it does like really fucking well. I've never really cared about money, so I never really had a problem with anybody. Anybody that hires me is like, fuck yeah, she doesn't like, <laughs> I'm not really a nickel or diming anybody. I'm just like, yeah, we're like, you know, I have people that help me out with that stuff. And I'm like, okay, just let me know when I can sign a thing and then I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna do fucking awesome and everyone's gonna be happy. And so far it's been working out. No milk in my mouth. Just amazing technique. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Rhonda, we have a recurring segment on our show called Explain That Gram, where we do a deep dive on our guest's Instagram, pull interesting pictures that need more context. Did I post these things? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. So it's crazy how you endured as MMA fighter, professional wrestler, only to severely injure yourself on a TV set. I was on doing 911, and they had like this episode where I a tsunami or whatever, like wiped out in LA. And literally like the first day of shooting, we're like down in Mexico filming in the tanks that they filmed Titanic in. And the director who was like, okay, you're gonna open this boat door and then come out, say your lines and then throw the shit in the water. I'm like, cool. So then I come out and I push up the, the, the door, but I'm like shorter than him and I'm going up steps at the same time. So it feels like the door is like going. I guess it just kind of like paused. On the way out, it like slammed on my hand and I was like, fuck. I like hit all my lines and then I grabbed all that shit and I threw it out the boat and I looked down my hand and like my fucking finger is off. I'm very good at like shutting down and not like showing pain when like shit's not going well for me. So I like kind of covered my hand up and I like, like turned to look at like the director, everybody like behind the, the camera. And I'm like, yeah. Um, I had a problem with my fingers off. And then they had to like put me in the ambulance. And it just so happened that in the emergency room or whatever was like a hand specialist that used to train with my husband down at like Alliance or something like that. And he was like, oh my God, what's up? And I'm like, you know, my finger fucking off, falling off. And um, yeah, I have like a plate and like eight screws. Look at this thing. Yeah. Wow. And you know, and I finally got it back down to a fist, which is all I cared about. You know, I don't care about flicking people off pretty. Like I feel like the extra knuckle makes it more intense. This is hotter than I would prefer, like at a restaurant, because I feel like the um, the hot sauce is really overpowering, and that I don't really get to taste the chicken or anything else that much. So like, it's above my preference, but not like above my ability. If that makes sense. 
Oh, wait, I already have Silver Zover Crown. So I know that you have a soft spot in your heart for anime. It's an art form now that's really gone mainstream. It's very commonplace now to see athletes from NBA players to UFC stars draw inspiration from shows like Dragon Ball Z. What, in your opinion, makes anime special as a storytelling genre compared to like the traditional American cartoon fair that we grew up on? What I loved about Dragon Ball Z that was so different than um, anything else that I'd seen in uh, like American cartoons was all of their powers they had to like really earn and work hard for. And it wasn't like Bruce Wayne had to get like a better, buy a better gadget because he's rich or you know, Superman was already tapped out or like this is somebody's powers because something happened to them. I think because I was working so hard to be like a judo master myself, I thought it was really cool to like see something like that about like martial arts. I think now like a lot of people are coming out that like, I love Dragon Ball Z because it's like you kind of had to hold it in and not talk about it your whole life. Just like I had to not talk about like judo tournaments or anything else like that. So it's like, it's like a big coming out party for everybody that are, you know, a couple decades removed from discovering it. <laughs> Ghost Pepper, oh fuck, this is the one that's coming to get me, huh? Woo! I, I literally do not want to clear my throat because I feel like I could hurt myself. <laughs> Wait till you get to the next one. Mm. That was a sharp left turn. There's definitely some like protests in my stomach. I don't even know which was better, the ranch or the blue cheese because they're there purely for survival purposes. <laughs> right, and who can focus in a time like this? Uh-huh. <laughs> so Rhonda, your name is synonymous with championship belts and Hollywood red carpets, but I know that you had to grind it out with a handful of odd jobs along the way. What was your biggest customer pet peeve back when you were working on the floor at Home Depot? Home Depot? There's a lot of like weird shit at the Home Depot. Like I ring things out with the little barcode thing, you know? So if you bring me some random piece of fucking whatever that could have been from anywhere in this entire warehouse and it doesn't have a barcode on it, right? Don't get all huffy and puffy with me when I have to break out the binder and look for this shit and like call somebody else, be like, do you know what this fucking thing is? And they're like, uh, well, uh, now I'm like, stop fucking beatboxing, okay? I am a minimum wage apron wearing, dealing with your ass type of bitch right now. Like, I'm a human, I am not a robot. I can't just scan this shit with my eyes. Like, like, let's calm down here. My nose is running, it's so spicy. All right, are you ready to move on to the next one? Yes. Be very careful with this one. This is the bomb beyond insanity. The bomb beyond insanity, shit. Yeah. And it's a, right. it's a wild one. It's a big step up between these sauces. Just fair mm -hmm. warning. Because I know you're very shoot first, ask questions later with the break and the, and the clean rip. I'm just looking out for you, Rhonda. In your corner on this one. Whoa. It's going down. I like immediately felt it in my nose. You're a cruel, cruel man. It actually burns my stomach and my nose and my throat at the same time. This is lemon juice because Gordon Ramsay did it, and I was wondering if it worked. <laughs> oh, you saw the Gordon Ramsay episode. Woo! Don't think that helps. Gordon, you failed me. Ugh. I licked my own lips and it hurt. Yeah. Here's a real tear. Rhonda, together, we'll rally through this one. Oh, God, dude. How would you describe the appeal of World of Warcraft to someone who's never played the game? Woo! Sorry if I'm like annoying people by chewing my mouth open, but I'm just really trying to get like some fucking circulation in my mouth. Um, I think WoW has stuff in it that really appeals to everybody. You know, it's like, you can have, can I have something that like, a thing that doesn't have the hot sauce on it so I don't like rub it on my face accidentally, please. Um, thanks dude. Thank you. Um, but like, World of Warcraft has like, Story mode. I literally blew my, blew my nose and the rest of my nose started burning from the inside. That's so how you can like play by yourself like solo if you're into like RPG stuff, but it has like really great PvP like mode. But it also has like pet battles, which is basically like Pokemon and 
like turn-based battles. And it has like a really great community too, you know? Like everybody there just, just like wants to help everybody else out. A lot of people have been playing for like over a decade, you know? There's a lot of people that are just into it as like a lifestyle. I mean, we're happy to welcome other people into that lifestyle. Um, my tears are burning my face. Like I feel like the hot sauce went in like my nose. I sniffed it up and went into my tear duct and it was like coming out burning my face. <sighs> Dousing it. Give me that milk. Definitely not as hot as the last one, but I'm not enjoying myself. <laughs> right, exactly. So outside of your accomplishments in the Octagon, you've shown yourself to be a natural on screen, appearing in a handful of network TV shows and major movie franchises like Fast and Furious. Can you give me one uniquely meathead quality of the Expendables set? Like when all of those action stars get together, is like the craft service just lean meats, rice, and protein smoothies? Oh, there are weights on set. They would literally be like lifting weights and doing bands and like curling things like between takes. It was a, it was a cool little boys club to be part of and I quite enjoyed everybody. I miss you guys. Yeah, I remember like we had like this thing, we had to like run up this roof a million times and I was in training camp for the second time I beat Meester's ass and I was like, oh, this is awesome. I can like use this as like my sprints for the day. And I'm like, every single take I'm like, sprint, sprint, gotta get my sprints in. And they were like, yeah, you need to like not be all the way over there. You need to like dial it back like 10 notches. Like everybody's gotta be rushing together to the helicopter. Schwarzenegger was really cool about saying get in the chopper for us. Got a really huge kick out of that, saying that in person. No one wanted to compete with me. They were just being like really sweet, very mentor-like. I learned a lot from everybody, for sure. Last dab, Apollo. I'm afraid. Cheers! Cheers, Rhonda. Okay, Ronda Rousey, here we are at the final bell of our 10 round fight against the wings of death and I can think of only one way to properly close this thing out. In our five years, nearly 200 episodes of Doing Hot Ones, I don't think that we've ever had a guest with a deeper, more profound connection to the hot wing. There are reports of you eating as many as 50 wings as part of a post-fight ritual and I've heard you explain the action of splitting bones and comparing it to like the, the carnal nature of a heated, bloody UFC fight. So now that we're here at the end, the world has to know, why are wings so sentimental to you? And pound for pound, what is the greatest chicken wing memory of your life? This is definitely painful. My inside of my nostrils are burning the most, which is very surprising to me. And um, dude, poor Trav is gonna have to deal with like the hottest farts in marriage tonight. Like, <laughs> oh man. When I was in training camp for fights, I would always, always crave hot wings. It just kind of became like associated with like victory and happiness was like the post winning wing. I will show you um, my happiest memory with hot wings. My friend Eric Williams took this for me. This is the best plate of wings I've ever had right here. And um, this was after I beat Betch Coea in Brazil, went total Rocky Four on that shit. Dana and Lorenzo, they actually flew down the sauce from Anchor Bar. They flew in a chef from Sao Paulo. They had these wings all specially made from a chef from a different city, from a sauce from a different country. It was the best. And I always like had the happiest memories with, with hot wings, so. This is definitely going to be another one of those. Not the, not the top, but you know, it's up there. This is definitely hey, a Hey, we are honored to be in the conversation. You guys have to hang that priceless piece of artwork up in the Louvre and look at you, Ronda Rousey, knocking out some of the hottest chicken wings in the history of planet Earth. Now there's nothing left to do but roll out the red carpet for you. This camera or that camera or whatever kind of setup you guys have going on in that perfect hot one set replica, let the people know what you have going on in your life. 
Uh, this is like the opposite of like a talk show when you like you go on and you're like, oh, I have this thing to promote. Like, we have a million different things in development that I actually can't talk about. So I have nothing to talk about except for how amazing No DMB Productions is. <laughs> Any production company I've set up this whole set. This is actually my uh, my bedroom, and the bed is over there for sound absorption. And this is a dresser. And um, we are the the best, the smallest, up and comingest production company on the planet. I mean, the baddest. Why didn't Why did I miss that opportunity? Um, but yeah, check out my um, my channel on YouTube. Ronda Rousey, just in it for the sport. Salute, my friend. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. I'm gonna go um, shit shards my pelvis. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, I'm gonna have to apologize, to Mr. Brown. He won't be able to eat my ass for a week. <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> that could be your sound bite. Bye. Hey, what's going on, Hot Ones fans? This is Sean Evans checking in to say thank you so much for watching today's video and join me in welcoming the newest member of the Hot Ones Hot Sauce family. This is the last dab Apollo, the only sauce made with the Apollo pepper the latest and greatest from the twisted mind of smoking Ed Curry. It is the hottest last dab we've ever made and the people who will taste it first are the subscription box subscribers who will get this one in October's box for everyone else probably sometime later in October. Heatness.com, heatness.com to learn more about the last dab Apollo, moment of silence for the last dab triple X, but it's okay. All new beginnings must come from some other beginning's end.